who is uh, uh, going to talk, his talk is going to be slightly different from what is announced. Phil has a great experience in computer science. He's professor of theoretical computer science at Edinburgh, but has worked in industry before at the Bell Labs, at Bio Labs. He was a professor of computer science at Glasgow University before then as well, so he's got very strong connections with Scotland. He's world famous for his work on uh, functional programming. In fact, you could say he's probably one of the fathers of modern functional programming languages, having been one of the principal programmers on Haskell and Java generics. He's a fellow of the SEM, a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, and he's recently, one of the highlights of his recent work has been giving something that is very close to this very talk as part of the Princeton Turing Centennial uh, celebrations. So without further ado, Phil Water, Church's Coincidences. Thank you for that. So let's deal with the technicalities first. Can people hear me? Yes. yes. Can people see me? Yes. No. <laughs> so um, as Gita mentioned, this is a talk that I gave at the Turing Centennial at Princeton. I apologize to you for changing the talk at the last minute, but I realized that the other talk is quite technical. And I would, this, well, the purpose of this talk is to get you where I can explain what the other talk is about, which is what I will do at the end. But um, I wanted to do this talk for a couple of reasons. How many people know who Alan Turing is? <laughs> right, most of you, good. How many people here are attending the two different Turing Centennial events happening in Manchester and Cambridge this week? Not too surprising. <laughs> so um, this is the week of Turing's 100th birthday. So there are two different events going on. Um, but you're not at any of them. You're here. So I thought it would be appropriate for me to repeat this talk because um, I want to say a little bit technical about Turing in this week. Uh, it's very clear that the push behind all these talks happening right now, somebody put very well at the Princeton event, they said, look, Turing made a contribution that is on a par of that made by Darwin, Newton, Einstein, and his name should be in that company. And so this, think of this as part of that movement to get that wide recognition that Turing deserves. Um, you'll also know that the highest award given out by the Association for Computing Machinery is the Turing Award. And in fact, at Princeton, I was speaking just after the first talk by Dana Scott, Turing Award winner. And um, I was just followed by Leslie Valiant, um, last year's Turing Award winner. So um, there was no pressure there at all. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a talk about lambda calculus. I love lambda calculus. <laughs> This is the cover of the journal that I helped to found, the Journal of Functional Programming. And in Edinburgh, we love lambda calculus. There is a, the streets of Edinburgh. <laughs> and this is the tie that I'm wearing right now, a gift from my wife. So, the title of this talk is Church's Coincidences. <coughs> I want to begin by saying a little bit about the notion of coincidence. So I want to talk about two different kinds of coincidence. Here's kind number one. Okay, the, the, there's a picture illustrating continental drift when all the continents were stuck together. Now, when I was back in elementary school, they gave us an exercise. And they said, here's a map of the Earth. They didn't show us this one. They showed us the Earth as it is now. And they said, look at the coasts of North America and South America, and look at the coast of Europe and Africa, and look, they kind of fit together. Why is that? And we had you know, one of these nice classroom discussions about why this might be. And then at the end of the discussion, they mentioned this idea of the theory of continental drift, and that the reason they looked the same is that all the continents were stuck together, and then they drifted apart. Now, I'm sorry to tell you this, but I am so old that when I was in elementary school, continental drift was not an accepted theory. So at the end of this discussion, they s said, so that's a theory, but nobody believes that. <laughs> the real reason why they look the same is, it's a coincidence. 
Okay, so that's one example of a coincidence, a coincidence that these days we don't believe is a coincidence. And here's a different example of a coincidence. So this is a coincidence you can explain. Here's a different example of a coincidence. That's a picture of a solar eclipse. So there's the moon in front of the sun, and oh look, you can see the sun's corona sticking out behind the moon. Why is that? Well, the reason for that is that the apparent size of the sun from the Earth and the apparent size of the moon from the Earth are almost exactly identical. And that has the nice property that then when the moon passes in front of the sun, you can actually see the corona peeking out behind. So this is a coincidence with a very beautiful consequence. Why are they the same? It's a coincidence! <laughs> is there some other theory that explains this the way continental drift explains the continents mapping up? Hmm. Intelligent design? That's kind of the best I can do, which is not a very good explanation. So, you know, is it like this because God wanted us to be able to see the corona? Not a particularly scientific explanation. So why do these two things coincide? So I'm going to show you one of each kind of coincidence. One that I can explain, and one that I can't. So, let's talk about effective computability. Okay. Effective computability is exactly like buses. You wait 2,000 years for one, and then four show up at once. Okay. So we've got four theories of effective computability published in the same year, 1936. Why is this? Why would you have a coincidence like that? So let me explain the story. So I'm going to skip the first part of this 2,000 years. I'm going to skip the bit that starts with Aristotle and ends with Russell and Whitehead. I'm going to begin around 1900 with David Hilbert, this man. So in 1900, Hilbert gave a famous talk in which he laid out a bunch of hard problems. And people would you know, later say, we solved Hilbert's tenth problem. We've solved Hilbert's second problem, and so on. I'm not going to talk about one of those problems. I'm going to talk about this problem, the Entscheidungsproblem, or decision problem, which was published in this book by Hilbert and Ackerman in 1928, The Foundations of Theoretical Logic. So this was a book about mathematical, making logic rigorous. Right? Logic had been around since Aristotle. People only began to really make it rigorous around the time of Boole. And then uh, many people, Piano, Freya, Russell and Whitehead, Dedekind, made contributions. And Hilbert, um, along with many of his students, such as Ackerman, was one of the people really pushing this program. It was called Hilbert's program. Put all of mathematics on a sound theoretical basis using symbolic logic. This is also what uh, Russell and Whitehead wanted to do with Principia Mathematica. So, one of the problems discussed in this book was, given a formula in first-order predicate logic, a formula of arithmetic, so it could be some arithmetic property, give an effective procedure for determining if that formula is true or false. Now, they didn't specify what they meant by effective procedure, but these days, we would call it an algorithm. But this was before you had the rigorous notion of algorithm. That's what effective calculability was. And they were very optimistic. They thought, yes, we can give um, such an algorithm. We can give such an effectively calculable method. So they didn't feel a need for a definition of effectively calculable. It's like art. When you see art, you know it's art. When you see an effectively calculable method, you know it's effectively calculable. So it's just some effective procedure that people could follow to resolve this. And they were very optimistic that you could do this. Right? So this is closely related to, com to completeness. Clearly, if you did, could do this, logic would be complete. Every single statement could either be proved true or proved false. This is a very optimistic view. And indeed, again, another famous address, not the 1900 one, but in Königsberg on the 8th of September 1930, speaking to the Society of German Scientists and Physicians, something that was 
also broadcast on the radio. He concluded with this statement, Wir müssen wissen, wir werden wissen. We must know, we will know. Extremely optimistic. Everything can be known. And you can see it was written on his tombstone. Well, that's strangely appropriate because of this map and what has been called by a pleasing irony the very day before, at the very same conference, Kurt Gödel presented a paper called On Formally Undecidable Propositions of Principia Mathematica and Related Systems, where he showed that mathematics was not complete, that you could never have a complete system of logic, that there would always be formulas which could not be proved true and could not be proved false. And in particular, he showed that there was a true formula that could not be proved true. And the way he did it was he used arithmetic to encode formulas. So many people, I guess, are familiar with Gödel numbers, which encodes a formula as a product of a, um, a large, of um, using prime numbers to represent the individual constituents. And you raise each prime to a number corresponding to a symbol, and then you can use the prime factorization there to recover the original formula from this large number. So you can encode formulas as numbers. You could also encode proofs as numbers. And he wrote out a lot of formal logical definitions. I won't go through all the details, but this is, the in effect, the first computer program that's a proof checker. And this formula here, which is defined in terms of 44 earlier ones, corresponds to the number x stands for a proof of the formula denoted by the number y. x is a proof of the formula y. And then he could say, OK, all of these were um, what one would call effectively calculable. Uh, and the only one that wasn't effectively calculable was this last one. x is provable, which means um, there exists a y such that y is a proof of x. So this there exists is not effective because there are an infinite number of possible proofs to look at. But you could state this rigorously. So now you can have a statement of logic rigorously referring to proof. And he showed, in fact, that there's a particular program, y0, which corresponds to um, not, sorry, a particular formula, x0, which corresponds to not the vagum of x0. In other words, a formula that says, this formula is not provable. It's a lot like the liar's paradox. Okay, if you think about it, you will realize that if the formula was provable, the logic would be inconsistent. So it must not be provable, but therefore you can't prove it. So it's a true formula that's not provable. It is said that Hilbert behaved very coldly towards Gödel mm -hmm. at that conference. Okay? That was Hilbert's program dead. All the optimism went away. There, you wouldn't always be able to have something that was true or something that was false. Nonetheless, you might say have an effective procedure for deciding if there was a proof of something. Could that be the case? Could you always in finite time decide if something was true? That'd be great if it were so. But people at this point began to doubt. So the race was on. So here's the first bus driver, Alonzo Church. And he developed something called the Lambda Calculus. Now, um, so he was a young faculty member at Princeton. He had studied under Hilbert. And in these days, if you were a logician, the way you made your name was you defined your own logical system. So he had his own logical system. And it was based on this thing called Lambda Calculus. So here's the idea behind Lambda Calculus. It's very simple, right? You end up talking about functions a lot if you're talking about logic. And it turned out to be very convenient to be a little bit formal about functions. An idea that went back to the earlier work of Frede and Russell and Whitehead and so on. But um, Church pinned it down. So here's the idea. Right? Normally when we talk about function, we'd say something like f of x is x squared plus x plus 42. So you, what we really are talking about here is f. So you'd like a definition of f as a function. So Church said, right, the way we'll do this is to say f is the function of x that returns for a given x, x squared plus x plus 42. So he said f is lambda x, x squared plus x plus 42. 
So writing lambda x in front was equivalent to this. It just says it is a function of x such that returns this value, which might involve x. Now, the reason that was useful is that then formulas like for all x a could be turned into saying, well, a depends on x. So a is really a function of x. So really, let's look at the function lambda x dot a and then apply this constant for all to it. So many of you will be familiar with notions of free and bound variables. Basically, what he said is all bound variables can be treated using lambda. So this binding operator for all I'd say turns into something using lambda, which is um, so you you've, all your x here is your bound variable, and the only binding operation you need is lambda. So it simplified things in that way. By the way, uh, if anybody has a question, if I say something that's not clear. Don't hesitate to raise your hand and ask. If you have a, a longer question or you want to argue with me, save that for the end. But if I say something that's not clear, please ask. Are there any questions yet? Don't be afraid. All right. So the actual lambda calculus itself was very simple. Um, it, it's like Beck's Fia, a particular kind of beer called Fia because it has just four ingredients. This is even simpler, just three ingredients. So um, the only readings are variables, lambda bindings, which we've just seen, and applications. And the way Church wrote them looked like that, and the way we write them today looks like that, so almost exactly the same thing. So the only things you can do have are variables, a lambda binding, and then a function applied to an argument. So L here is a function, it will reduce to a lambda expression, and N is its argument. So this is what we would write as, uh, so L might be um, F, and M might be X, and this is F of X. So here's the paper in which he had his logic, and part of the logic is lambda calculus. So there it is, the very first lambda in a lambda abstraction. And this, by the way, is the complete definition of the lambda part of his um, lambda calculus part. So right, here's lambda abstraction, uh, here's application, um, and, and here he said exactly what I saw on the previous page. These are the only three ways of building lambda terms, plus the definition of free and bound variable. That's my other thing. So complete definition of the lambda calculus in just a couple of lines. Um, now, he also went on and he had this whole logic. Okay? But he did note early in the paper, in the introduction, he says, there may indeed be other applications of the system than its use as a logic. So we will see that that turned out to be <coughs> prophetic. OK, so then the race is on. How do you define effectively calculable? And Church decided the answer is it's effectively calculable. There's some procedure by which you can work it out. It's an algorithm. It's something that anybody with pencil and paper and enough time and patience could do by following a set routine. Any of those notions. What it corresponds to is, um, you can write it down as a lambda term. What? Lambda terms only had functions. Right? At least you need numbers and arithmetic and all this other stuff. Where are those? Well, it turned out you can get those out of lambda calculus. So for instance, um, he said the way we'll do numbers, one, two, three, and so on, is one is something that takes an A and a B, and then applies A to B. So this, by the way, is an abbreviation for lambda A, lambda B, A applied to B. Two also takes an A and a B and applies A twice to B. Three takes an A and a B and applies A three times to B. Do you see a pattern? <laughs> so you could encode numbers in this way. So they said, look, you can encode numbers, and you can have a lambda term that you apply to this, and you reduce it. I'll explain lambda reduction later. You reduce the lambda term to another lambda term, which must also stand for a number. So you take a number, turn it into a lambda term, apply this other lambda term, which stands for your effective procedure to it, reduce it, and you get back another number, which is your answer. Well, another lambda term, which corresponds to a number in this way, which corresponds to your answer. Okay. By the way, he didn't have zero, because he had this rule that said if you have lambda A and lambda B, both A and B must appear in the body. If you have lambda x something, x must appear in the body. He ruled out trivial functions. 
Later, it was decided that's a bad. You don't need to rule them out. You can allow trivial functions. And then you would get 0 as lambda a, b, b. Apply a 0 times. But he didn't have that. OK, it turns out, once you've got this definition, it's pretty easy to figure out how to multiply, um, add, and so on. Um, well, multiply and add are easy. Subtract was not easy. We'll say something about that in a minute. Um, so this was his definition. Now, why did, were, were, were people concerned about this? Remember what I said. Right? At first, everybody was optimistic. There will be such an algorithm. But now people became pessimistic. They wanted to show, no, there isn't such an algorithm. Now to show, right, art, if I look at art, I know it's art, because I, you know, I know if I like it, I know if it's art. Um, artists resist having a definition of art that we could apply and say, no, that's not art. It doesn't meet the definition. Right? But to be able to prove there's no effectively calculable way of determining if a formula is true, then you need a very rigorous definition of effective calculability. So that's why people became interested in having a rigorous definition. And then once Church had this rigorous definition, it's a lambda term, then he could, he could show that there was a problem that was not solvable. And indeed, it, uh, either this paper or the following one, he showed the Achaidu's problem was not solvable. There is no lambda term that could determine if um, a formula, or rather the Gödel number of a formula, corresponded to a formula that was true or false. So you couldn't just look at something and have a computer decide if it was true or false. That's not possible. And that worked because he had this definition of what a computer could do, which, which is pretty good, right? Because computers didn't exist yet. So here's your definition of computer. It's what a lambda term can do. Now, Gödel was visiting at Princeton. And Gödel looked at this definition of churches. And Gödel said, what? That? corresponds to effective calculability? Right? Lambda terms are pretty abstract, right? just the notion of function. And he said, why is it that? And Church just sort of said, well, look, if you think you can do better, you come up with your own definition, and I'll prove my definition is equivalent to yours. So Church gave some talks. Sorry, not Church. Gödel gave some talks. Uh, right. Gödel gave some talks um, where Gödel proposed. Right, this is highlighted in Kleene's paper. A definition of a general recursive function of natural numbers was suggested by Herbrand to Gödel. Then Gödel modified it, and it was used by Gödel with an important modification in a series of lectures at Princeton in 1934. So, in 1934, Gödel gave these lectures where he said, "I think this idea corresponds." to a notion of effective computability. And this is what we now call recursive functions. So it's just something that, right, here's your scheme for defining a function in terms of other functions. And here's a scheme for defining a function by recursion. Phi of 0 is this other function of the free variables. Phi of y plus 1 is defined in terms of phi of y and all the other free variables, and then you combine that in some way. So just definition by recursion. Now, um, Kleene, asked, so Kleene then proved, now Kleene was a student of churches, okay? Um, so Kleene proved that Gödel's definition and Church's definition were equivalent. And Kleene said, you know, for, for his first few years, he would always give talks in terms of lambda calculus. And he said, quote, he always got a very cold reception from his audiences, because they thought, just like uh, Gödel, what is this lambda stuff? Um, he then switched over to using recursive function theory after he proved this equivalence. He said, I couldn't complain of my reception after that. So many people found lambda terms unnatural, um, partly because there was no good user manual for them, right? There was only. Um, so these days, right, you find lambda expressions in languages like Python and Perl. Okay, but, but in those days, 
they were considered very weird. Okay. Now, the most important thing that Cleany did was it was Cleany. Remember, so we've got this hypothesis, right? Hypothesis: anything you can define that you could do with the effectively computably, you could do with a lambda term. And we had this way of embedding numbers into lambda terms. And once you had that, it was very easy to see um, how to define successor, adding one to something, how to define addition, how to define multiplication. Those were all really easy. Let's see, how about taking one away from something? Predecessor. Not easy. They couldn't figure out how to do it. Then one day, Cleany went to the dentist. He was feeling a bit nervous as you do when you go to the dentist. He was put under the laughing gas, and he started to hallucinate. And he figured out how to do predecessor. Right? So if you have a hard problem, go to the dentist. Um, and this is his explanation of how to do predecessor, and it involves triples and successor, and I won't go into it right now. It's um, not something you want to just see on the fly, but once you see it, it's pretty easy. Okay? Um, and then he went back to church and said, look, I've done predecessor. And church said, wow, I was just about to give up on this Lambda stuff. But then, once they figured out they could do predecessor, they decided, you can do anything. So it's not too surprising that people looked at this and said, what do you mean that's everything you could do? It's not even clear you can do predecessor. OK, you figured out how to do predecessor. But why does that mean you can do everything you could want to do? So, but, right? There's this other definition of everything you could want to do, Gödel's definition, and they proved it equivalent. So that's good evidence, right? So then Church goes back to Gödel and says, look, we proved it equivalent. And of course, what does Gödel say? Oh. Maybe I was wrong then. Because <laughs> Gödel didn't believe in this Lambda stuff. Enter the driver of the third bus, Alan Turing. So he also comes up with his own definition of a computing machine. And again, shows the Enchidens problem is undecidable using this definition. Um, and he did this completely independently of Church. He was a, um, a graduate student, so he, he got his undergraduate degree, so he didn't yet have his graduate degree at Cambridge, working on his own. This was basically the first paper he wrote. I was really when I finally read Turing's biography, I realized that was the first thing he did? Boy, was I depressed. <laughs> um, but he did something in this paper very important that had not been done in the other papers. He did something that I normally consider as airy-fairy useless stuff, but actually sometimes is concretely of huge importance. The technical name for what he did this airy-fairy stuff is philosophy. The key ingredient that Church added over what was before was philosophy. He tried to explain why one should believe that a Turing machine can do anything that a human could do executing an effectively calculable procedure. And he begins the paper by saying that that's what he's going to do. I'll give some arguments with the intention of showing that the computable numbers include all numbers which could naturally be regarded as computable. So he called them the computable numbers, but he wanted to show they really correspond to what's computable. And he gets very concrete about it. Right? And I show that certain large classes of numbers are computable. They include, for instance, the real parts of all algebraic numbers, the real parts of the zeros of the Bessel functions, the numbers pi and e, and so on. Right? You would not have found Church talking about the real parts of the zeros of the Bessel functions. So and then he defines Turing machines with the tape and the symbol and the store and so on, which I will presume you're familiar with. And this is his definition of the very first Turing machine written out. This is a Turing machine that prints 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, and so on infinitely on the tape. He was actually inf interested in Turing machines that computed infinite sequences because he wanted to compute real numbers. 
And then he gave this argument, and much later Robin Gandy, who was Turing's only graduated PhD student, wrote a paper explaining what it was that Turing had done. And he said, look, right, this is philosophy, but in fact, this is as rigorous as most of mathematics. So if you have these axioms saying what a person can do, such as um, there's only a fixed, there's a fixed upper bound to the number of the six symbols which could be written in a cell. Um, there's a fixed upper bound on the number of cells that you could reach from a given cell quickly at a glance, and so on. And then given these constraints, you could prove that everything that a human could do following these constraints could be done by a Turing machine and vice versa. So this is what Gandhi called um, Turing's real important theorem, which is that any function which can be calculated by a human being can be computed by a Turing machine. And this is what I'm calling philosophy. Um, and then, so, Turing comes up with his own definition of infective computability and shows you can't solve the Entscheidung's problem. And he goes to see uh, Max Neumann, who uh, he learned about this problem from, and says, look what I've done. And Max has been keeping up with the literature, and he says, uh-oh. There's this other guy, Church. He already did it. So they look at Church's stuff and they decide, well, maybe there's something a little bit new and, and different in, in our technique, and it's worth publishing as well as what Church published. And then Newman writes off to Church and says, here's a draft paper, I'd like you to look at it. Hey, maybe you'd like to have this guy Turing as your doctoral student. So Turing goes off to Princeton and completes his PhD under church in two years. That's going to make you all wince, right? <laughs> um, and as part of that, he wrote out, so when the paper was finally published, this paper, it had an appendix saying, oh yes, there's this other paper by church, and here's a sketch of why everything lambda, um, that's lambda calculable is also calculable by a Turing machine and vice versa. Um, but then he wrote it out in much greater detail in this paper that he published a year later while at Princeton. Um, so this is the paper where he just works out in great detail the proof that... Um, and what he does is right, he takes the universal Turing machine, which can do anything any Turing machine can do, and he writes a lambda expression that does what that can do. And he also writes um, a Turing machine that can compute the value of any lambda expression. So it's, it's the first lambda interpreter written on a computer. Again, a few years before computers come along. Um, and and I've, I've always liked this sentence in the paper. Um, so he says, um, right, I'm going to show their equivalent. Um, the identification of effectively calculable functions with computable functions is possibly more convincing than an identification with the lambda definable or general recursive functions. Right, so this is Church's definition, this is Cleany's definition based on Gödel's, and he says, well, right, this is him bragging a bit, I think I gave a better argument for why effectively calculable should correspond to a Turing machine. And they says, um, for those who take this view, that is, for those who believe in Turing machines but not in lambda expressions, the formal proof of equivalence provides a justification for Church's calculus and allows the machines which generate computable functions to be replaced by the, emphasis added by myself, more convenient lambda definitions. Turing was very discerning. Um, so he understood that lambda definitions were much nicer to write down than Turing machines. But nobody else did. Everybody else preferred the Turing machines. So it took us a long time to get back to where we were in 1936. Turing, of course, is one of those, along with von Neumann, who was very familiar with Turing's work, and others who built the first automatic computers. Right? Turing became involved with this with code breaking during the war, where they had to build proto-computers to do code breaking, and then afterwards he started working on real computers. So he designed something called the ACE, and this is part of one of his documents describing the ACE. Um, the ACE never actually got built. Right? During the war at Bletchley Park, 
If Turing needed something done, he could literally write to Churchill, and Churchill would jump up and down, and it would get done. That didn't happen after the war. Turing didn't have somebody to run interference for him, and didn't end up building the first actual computer. He just designed it, and then other people built slightly different things, because there's a race on again. Um, so here's part of um, the paper describing this. I've always loved this particular quote. So he's talking about programming the computer. He said, instruction tables will have to be made up by mathematicians with computing experience and perhaps a certain puzzle-solving ability. Right? Remember, he'd been at Bletchley Park, where that was exactly what everybody had. Um, there need be no real danger of it ever becoming a drudge, for any processes that are quite mechanical may be turned over to the machine itself. So already he understood the idea of things like compilers that could turn a high-level programming language into executable code. Fourth bus, Emil Post. I didn't know about this before. Right? So Post is famous for other models of computability that came along later. But in the same year, 1936, he published a paper describing a machine that could do anything that was effectively calculable. And if you read his definition, it looks just like Turing's, exactly like Turing's, except cleaner and more readable. <laughs> so why do we remember Turing and not Post? Two reasons. First of all, Post just, if this is like a three-page paper saying, here's the definition of effectively calculable. He doesn't prove the undecidability of the Enchidrin's problem using it. He doesn't prove any theorems at all. He just says, here's the right definition. But also, he just says, here's the right definition. He didn't do philosophy. He didn't give the argument that Turing gave for why anything that's effectively calculable should be um, calculable in this way. Okay? So there's a coincidence. Four definitions of effective calculability come along at once. Is this so amazing? No, they all came along in this year because not that much before, right, 1933, was when Gödel published the proof of undecidability that got people thinking, ah, maybe you can't solve the Entscheidung's problem, but to prove that, you need a definition of what's effectively calculable. So that's why they all came along in this year. Continental drift. I want to show you a solar eclipse. The second coincidence, propositions as types. Very little to do with Turing here, but a lot to do with church, and a lot to do with logic. Let's go back a wee bit. Here's Gerhard Gensen, um, brilliant logician, also a Nazi, I'm sorry to tell you. But in 1935, he published the definition of logic. This is the most widely used system of logic to this day. So, right, there are various different systems, Hilberts, Russell and Whiteheads, and so on. This is the one that we ended up standardizing on. It's because he had this brilliant insight that the rules of logic should come in pairs. Introduction and elimination pairs. So here's his thing, and we're going to focus on two of these rules. This one here, the rules for implication, and these here, the rules for conjunction. So here they are in modern notation. And if you look back, you'll see I've done, written exactly what Genson wrote in his original paper. It's completely identical. The only difference is he wrote his letters in German. There's a German A and a German B. And I'll write the letters in English. Okay, so this, here is his formulas. So what does this say? So the square brackets means assume. If assuming that A is true, you can prove B, then you can conclude that A implies B. Not too surprising. If you can prove A implies B, and you can prove A, then you can conclude B. That's kind of the definition of implication. That's what implication means. That's how you use an implication. So this lets you derive an implication. Uh, and this lets you use an implication. Introduce an implication, implication below the line. Eliminate an implication, implication above the line, but not below. 
Here's another example, conjunction. If you can prove A and you can prove B, you've proved A and B. That's what A and B means. If you've proved A and B, then how can you use that? Well, you can conclude two things from this. You can conclude A and you can conclude B. This will be dull and boring to many of you, right? Um, OK, so this is the way we formulate logic. Um, and then his great insight was that you could simplify proofs. In particular, if you had an introduction followed by an elimination, you could always simplify it. So here we introduce an implication. Right? From assuming A, if we can derive B, then we know A implies B. But here we've got a proof of A. And we want a proof of B. So instead of use, doing it this roundabout way, well, where did we start? We said, assuming A, you can prove B. Fine! Don't assume A. Here's a proof of A. So in this, you replace your assumption of A by the actual proof of A, and then prove B. Similarly, if um, from A and B, you can prove A and B, and then we use the elimination rule to get A, What's an easier way of doing that? Hmm. Oh, look! I've got a proof of A right here. Fine, I'll just use that. So it's very easy. Why did he care about simplifying proofs? Well, notice that in these proofs, we have a formula. Here A implies B, and here A and B, which doesn't appear as an assumption and doesn't appear as a conclusion. And in particular, in the closed proof, with no conclusions, right, you might want to show that the only formulas you need are subformulas of the formula you're proving, not something bigger like A implies B or A and B. So he could show the subformula property using this simplification that when you proved something, you could prove it just using the formula you're proving and parts of it. You didn't need anything extraneous. Why was that important? Well, one thing you want to know about a logical system is consistency which in this case means there's no way to prove false. And this normalization property, the subformula property, the thing that says to prove something, you can only use parts of it. Not, you, you can always prove it using parts of it and not anything else, was really helpful. Because imagine the formula false. Right? Here it is. He wrote it this way. So this is from A. If you can prove A and you can prove not A, you can conclude false. Notice that this proof of false involves two bigger things, A and not A. So if you could normalize things, it says if there's a proof of false, there would be one involving only false and the parts of false. How many parts does false have? Not very many. Right? It's like, what part of no don't you understand? <laughs> so if only proofs of false had to involve just false and its parts, of which there aren't any, then you look at these rules and you go, oh, there is no way to prove false. You know your logic's consistent. That's why he was interested in simplifying proofs. So that's how you simplify proofs. Let me give you an example. Here's the simplest proof I can think of. Uh, I want to prove that B and A implies A and B. Not too surprising, right? We better be able to show that. Uh, how would I show it? Well, let's assume B and A. So from B and A, Right? By E1, I can conclude A. And by E0, I can conclude B. Oh, now I've proved A and B, so I've proved A and B. Now I can discharge the assumption, remember? If assuming this thing, um, I can prove this, then I've shown that B and A implies A and B. So I've discharged the assumption. And that's why I've written little Zs on this and a Z here. This discharges the assumption. We're not making that assumption anymore. We've just shown with no assumptions that B and A implies A and B. OK, how would I use that proof? Well, let's see. Here I've got a proof of B and A. I've got a proof that B and A implies A and B, so I can conclude A and B. Now remember, we have rules showing how to simplify this. The rule says to simplify it, instead of assuming B and A, just copy this bit of the proof. So I'll copy that bit of the proof there and there. Notice. In this case, the proof's getting a little bit smaller. Notice the proof doesn't always get smaller. It only gets simpler. We've removed an intermediate formula. But notice that this assumption could be used once, twice, three times. 
This proof could be very big. So if this is, assumption is used many times, and the proof is very big, we'll actually make a larger proof, but a simpler proof. And we can always keep simplifying the proof. So notice that when I take this using and introduction and copy it here, I now have an introduction on top of an elimination and an introduction on top of an elimination. And so I can now simplify again. And so now here I've got my direct proof. Right? So here's an indirect proof of A and B from B and A. And here's the direct proof. OK, so that was what Genson did. Let's go back to Alonzo Church. So that paper of Genson's appeared, remember, in 1935. Oh, I didn't mention, by the way, right? this is really a remarkable paper. Um, because first, this is the system of logic most used today. Second, he gives another system of logic in it, um, sequent calculus, which is the second most used system. And third, he was the first person to write an upside down A to mean for all. People had for all, but they didn't write it as an upside down A. They wrote exist as a backwards E, but he was the first person to write as a, all that in one paper. There's a goal for your PhD. <laughs> Back to Alonzo Church. Now, in 1932, remember, he introduced lambda calculus. And remember that his system of logic turned out to be inconsistent. It fell prey to something similar to Russell's paradox. So then he found this other use of lambda calculus, defining effective calculability. But in 1940, he went, hmm, let's add types to the lambda terms. So, Here's a term, lambda xn. Well, if x has type A and n has type B, so colon means has type, then lambda xn is a function from A to B. He didn't write it this way. He just wrote a B next to an A to mean a function with argument A and result B. Clearly, if L is a function with argument A and result B, and m is a function with argument A, then L applied to m would be something of type B. Right? So L might be a function from integers to integers, m might be an integer, you apply the function, and you get another integer. Um, similarly, pairs. So here m has type a, and has type b. So the pair mn would be a pair of an a and a b. Um, again, he actually encoded pairs in terms of functions, but I'm not going to do that, just to simplify things. Um, and again, right? if l is a pair, you can extract either its left component, L0, um, its zeroth component, or its oneth component, its right component, L1. So if this is a pair of an A and a B, clearly its left component is an A and its right component is a B. Now, remember I told you you could evaluate lambda terms. I didn't show you the rule. Here's the rule. It's very simple. If you have lambda xn, applied to m, what is that? It's going to be just take every occurrence of x in n and replace it by m. So that's there. Now notice that what this means, right here we had that uh, x has type a. So when we replace every occurrence, right, we'll get a bigger term. And everywhere that there was an x in n, we now have an m. But here we're x has type a, m has type a, so this is also well typed. So I've shown you that as I do what's called beta reduction, that the term remains well typed. Similarly, if um, I do this kind of reduction, which says that select out the zeroth component of mn and you get m, well, mn is well typed. Um, mn zeroth component has type a if mn has type a and b, which means m has type a and n has type b reduces to m, which must have type a. So reduction leaves terms well typed. Um, does that process always terminate? Turns out that's not completely obvious. Turns out the first proof was done by Turing, but never published. The actual proofs were done late, the published proofs were done later. So here's a typical program. Um, it's going to take a BA pair to an AB pair. What does this mean? Well, this is a pair whose first component is a B and whose second component is an A. 
This is a pair whose first component is an A and second component is a B. It's different, right? How would you do that? Well, you take Z, your BA pair, and you return the f one component, which is of type A, followed by the zero component, which is of type B. So you just swapped the elements of this pair. And you can see it's well typed. And then we can take this program to reverse a pair. Here's a particular pair, the yx pair. So what are we going to do? We'll substitute yx for z. So this z and this z I'll replace by yx. And then I'm selecting out the one component and the zero component. But of course, the one component of yx is x. And the zero component of yx is y. So the answer is if I take yx and apply the swapping function to it, I get xy, as you would expect. <coughs> Okay, now, um, we all expect spectacle when we go to the theaters these days. Literally, right, it should be in 3D, which means you get your 3D spectacles. So I made arrangements with the people at six in advance. I hope these were carried out. But as you came in, were you handed your, 3D your special 3D goggles in red and blue? Except these are different than the ones in red and blue. These are red only. So these little paper goggles, red on both sides. You all got those, right? No? Oh, I should have changed the talk at the last minute. <laughs> Sorry. So you'll have to pretend. So I want you to pretend you're putting on your rose-colored glasses. Right? These little 3D glasses, but with red on both sides. So put those on. And what you'll see here, of course, if you put on your rose-colored glasses, um, all the red stuff vanishes, and you'll just be left with the blue, which looks purple. Does that look familiar? It's a coincidence! <laughs> so that's a coincidence. Right? These were done completely independent. They're both about logic. They were both done by logicians. But completely independent. And then they turn out to be the same thing. Right? The way, so I was, right, to make this work out, I wrote function implication, sorry, function space as an implied sign and uh, product pairing as an ampersand. But normally we write those as arrow and time. So arrow is like implies, times is like conjunction. This is a drawing by Luca Cardelli. Of, so we call this thing the Curry-Howard isomorphism. Luca called this picture the Curry-Howard homeomorphism, showing how you can change one into the other. So this is just a funny picture. But the actual idea you've just seen is that these things are in very precise correspondence. Implication is just like functions. Conjunction is just like pairing. We haven't done it, but it turns out that um, disjunction is just like choice, variance. So all the important data structures arise directly out of logic. So this was written down much later. Right, so you have these two things done in 1980. It wasn't until 1980 that Howard published what I just showed you. Oh, it's completely obvious. Yes, it's completely obvious once you've seen it, but not before. Right? So from 1935 and 1940, when Genson and Church published these things, to 1980, 40 years later, was how long it took published. Actually, this idea was seen by... Curry in 56 in a different form. Howard first saw it at the beginning of the 70s. Other people, Martin Loth, saw it at the beginning of the 70s. So not quite 40 years, but at least 25 years. Okay. Keep that in mind, right? Because Absurd now wants us to write about impact. What is impact? Some research you've done that has had industrial impact within 20 years. It can take a lot longer. So this is the Curry-Howard correspondence. Right? It's often called propositions as types. But it's deeper than that, because proofs correspond to programs. You've see, seen all this. And normalization of proofs corresponds to evaluation of programs. You saw all that. Ah, it's a coincidence. It just so happens that natural deduction turns out wasn't even full natural deduction. I was doing intuitionistic natural deduction intuitionistic natural deduction. And um, 
simply type lambda calculus correspond. But nothing else does. No. Everything does. I'm getting to the end, so I won't go through this in detail. But basically, every single system of logic corresponds to an interesting programming language. I'm well known for doing stuff with things called monads in Haskell, which you used to do input-output. They correspond to a particular flavor of modal logic. Um, I mentioned that what was done was for uh, intuitionistic logic. Turns out for classical logic it works and corresponds to something called continuation passing style. And in particular, Peirce's law corresponds to an operator invented by Matthias Felizen called call CC. Peirce's law invented in the um, late 1800s, um, call CC written down I think in the 1980s, equivalent seen in 1990. So it's very robust. Uh, I'll skip this because I'm short on time, but it applies to lots of things. And also it means, um, right, we saw this correspondence with proofs, it means you could use lambda expressions to write down proofs. So there are a lot of automated proof systems these days based on that idea where you represent the proof using lambda terms. Um, I won't talk about this at all because we're at the end. Um, I thought this might happen. Right. But what was the originally scheduled talk? Well, I said it works for everything. One well-known exception, process calculi. Very important, right? These days, we all walk around with computers in our pockets that talk to each other. These days, um, Moore's Law used to meant that every 18 months, things got twice as fast. These days, Moore's Law, because of power consumption problems, you can't make things twice as fast anymore. Moore's Law still holds, but you don't get a computer that's twice as fast Every 18 months, you get twice as many computers. Right? So these year, we have quad-core computers. Wait another two years, we'll have eight-core computers. Wait another two years, 16-core computers. Uh, wait a minute. You better do parallel programming for that. That's hard. So the th one thing that's really important to understand is process some form of process calculus that lets us do parallel programming. So wouldn't it be great if there was a process calculus that corresponded to a logic? And then we could guess that's the right one. But we haven't had that until now. So if I had more time, I would tell you how to do that. But I won't. It has to do with something called linear logic. OK, I'm going to finish by doing some philosophy. All right, we've seen two coincidences, one which we can explain. One, why are the why does every logic correspond to a programming language? Why is the apparent size of the moon and the sun the same? God wanted us to be able to see how beautiful the aurora is. Why does every logic correspond to a programming language, a functional language? God wanted to tell us to use functional languages. Let me finish with some philosophy. Let's say you want to talk to aliens. And we've actually thought about doing this, right? This is a plaque on the side of the um, Voyager um, satellite. And it shows, you know, here it is leaving the solar system. Here's what we look like. There's a picture of the Voyager behind it. Uh, these are all the nearby stars to Earth and their distance. And these things um, explain the distance using markings in binary. Okay, So say aliens pick this up. What bits would they understand? They could probably work out the distance corresponded to distance. These markings correspond to binary. These are frequencies of quasars. They could probably figure that out. This is a picture of a helium atom. They might figure that out. Oh, there are two things there. Yeah, that's two things in the nucleus of helium. OK. Um, this, well, they understand this. right? It depends. Um, they might look at that and go, oh, I don't know. Right? If Star Trek is right, they'll look at that and they'll go, oh, they're just like us. <laughs> but they don't have pubic hair. <laughs> um, so they might or might not understand this. But this they'll work out. Okay, well, this is what the popular press thinks of aliens. right? They come to Earth and they build up blow up buildings. This is a film from 1996. Back when blowing up big buildings in New York was fantasy. 
the innocent days. And how would you destroy the aliens? Well, the war of the world, you give the Martians, a vi the Martians die of a virus. So in this modern remake, they die of a computer virus. Here's the actual computer virus that the heroes give to the aliens and all the alien ships then crash. <laughs> this is a screen grab. So this film came out in 1996. I just moved to working at Bell Labs. I went, wow, it's C. There's something done by the person down the corridor from me um, that's made it into a popular film. Of course, it's a strange dialect of C. It only has open braces. <laughs> Wait a minute, maybe it's Java? Java had been invented by then. Uh, but whatever it is, C or Java, it must have spread throughout the known universe because you can program alien computers using it. <laughs> Right, so it doesn't seem very likely. All right, aliens will not know C. Aliens will not know Java. Will aliens know lambda calculus? <laughs> they'll know modus ponens. If you know modus ponens and you know natural deduction, they'll know lambda calculus. So lambda calculus is universal. Right, we talk about the universal could be, this is really universal. Right, if you send a message to aliens in lambda calculus, they could decipher it. C or Java, I'm not so sure. Lambda calculus, they'll be able to do it. Now, except, right, these days we don't just talk about the universe, we talk about multiverses. This is from a popular play um, called Constellations. It has the best stage direction I've ever seen. You know, normally it says there's a big stage over here, people enter at the door over here, and so on. There's only one line. The one line says, an indented rule stands for a change of universe. So different universes, we're used to this idea now, in even in popular culture. So imagine a different universe. They might have a different gravitational constant. Might have different laws of physics. I don't know about you, but I cannot imagine a universe where modus ponens doesn't hold, where natural deduction doesn't hold. Right? So even in a different universe, if we could communicate with it, they would understand about logic. And therefore, of necessity, they would have to understand about lambda calculus. So, right, I don't want to call lambda calculus the universal programming language. And the reason why is calling lambda calculus the universal programming language is too limited. <laughs> lambda calculus is omniversal. So um, I'm at the end. Where did you buy that? <laughs> I made it. <laughs> I tried to actually put this for sale on Cafe Press, and they said, no, you can't sell that, it's a copyright violation. <laughs> so I, I wanted to make it so that anybody could buy one if they wanted it, but uh, they won't let me. There's, there's a question there. So why is there a Turing centenary and not a church centenary? Is that sort of like a political situation, or is that like really Turing to a lot more than church? Or modern I think church is under-remembered. But I would still place Turing above church. Um, Turing did do this important piece of philosophy. Turing also did this important stuff with code breaking during the war. Turing also was the first one to think about AI applications of computers and how you might give a rigorous definition of what it means for something that's not a human being to be intelligent. And Turing, it turns out, also did fundamental work in biology. He did work on morphogenesis, which means, well, how do you start from a uniform egg getting something that has legs over here and a tail over here and spots over there? And he did some of the um, fundamental work in that area. So Turing did a lot of very fundamental things. Church did something very important, very fundamental. But as you can see, it's not just Church who's part of the story. It's also Genson and Hilbert and many others. Um, so I'm, I'm happy for Turing to have pride of place over Church, but I am not happy for Turing machines to have pride of place over lambda calculus. Everybody should learn lambda calculus first and Turing machines as a historical oddity. Turing should have pride of place, but not Turing machines. Any more questions? Phil is also going to be around, as I mentioned earlier, he has another industrial experience as well as a very vast academic experience, so he will be on the panel for the transcript session on what happens when you do the phase transition from PhD student to normal human. And uh, so 
there would be something other aspects. Turing never did, I think. Uh, possibly not. Uh, but you did. I didn't, uh, for example. So, <laughs> if there are no more questions about church's coincidences, well, let's thank Phil again for a very inspiring. <laughs>